Um, first of all, it's such a pleasure to be here at Strata. Um, this is my second Strata event, and, and uh, it's really great to be here with, with such an amazing group of data professionals. And all of us do work with, with information in, in all kinds of different ways. Um, I am the data artist in residence at the New York Times, um, which perhaps backs up my theory that the best jobs are the ones in which you can make your own titles. Um, and, and I work in the R&D group where, where we work on a lot of projects involving data, both big and small. But I'm not going to talk to you about any of those projects today. Instead, I want to tell you a story about a project that I worked on which has defined the way that I think about data in, in many, many ways. And like a lot of good stories, this story starts with a moment of serendipity. So I'm going to take you back um, into 2008 and talk a little bit about a project that I was working on which led up to this, this, this main story that I want, want to discuss. So like any good story, this story involves some people. Um, and, and the first person that I want to introduce you to is Alex Beim. Alex runs a company called um, Tangible Interaction. And Tangible works on really large scale crowd interactive um, technology. But, but when I was working with Alex, we were working on a very, very unique project. Um, Alex had been approached by uh, the city of Richmond, which is a suburb of Vancouver. And they had asked him if he wanted to bid on the design of a 1,000 square meter playground, an accessible playground, so a playground that would be um, valuable for kids with disabilities. And, and he approached me because he had a really innovative idea. He, he wanted to actually evolve this playground. He wanted to produce a set of algorithms that would design a playground within the available space. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this project because it's just a lead up. But like almost every project I work on, this is a, a, a great opportunity and, and a seemingly perfect problem to work on. But almost every problem that you start with, you start with some expectations and those expectations change. So our expectation looked like this. But in reality, the space that we had to build the park in looked like this. Now, when you're building an accessible playground, um, you have a maximum grade that you're allowed to have as a slope in the park, which is 5%. Now, that piece of land that I just showed you sat on a grade of 12%. So this was a quite a, an interesting problem. And what I did is I wrote a software program combined with an algorithm which evolved lay possible layouts for the park. So this tool built in, in, in a program called Processing allowed us to, to iterate through many, 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 many variations of, of landscapes that would fit into this park and would solve that really, really binding criteria that we had that this park had to be at a certain uh, layout. So this, this tool allowed us to, to place objects in the park, to design the paths, to place it into 3D space. Um, and, and, and we were able to, to produce a layout that, that was eventually built um, to fit the space of that park. Now, this has nothing to do with what we're going to talk about today. <laughs> but this project, which was about using novel um, algorithms, sort of hand-rolled algorithms, to solve a problem that was unique and had a lot of constraints, was what brought me into the uh, main thing that I want to talk about. Here's the park under construction. And that brings me to another person. This is Dan Schiffman, who I teach with at ITP, which is a, a master's program at New York University. So um, Dan had been approached and by, by somebody who asked him if he could think of anybody who might be able to work on this really novel problem that, that, they, ha that they had, which it was going to involve the algorithms and was going to involve a very large public space. And because of my work on the playground, and I'd consulted with Dan on a couple of uh, pieces of that project, he thought, you yeah, know, maybe this Canadian guy, this, uh, this guy from Vancouver, might be able to help you out with that project. So that's how I got involved with, with this project that I want to talk to you about today. And actually, it started, from my perspective, with, with this email. Um, and, and it has the most boring subject line possible. It says, potential freelance job. <laughs> and, and I was sitting in the audience, like, very much like you, I was sitting in the audience of a conference at the time when this email came in. Very much unlike you, I was bored. And so I, I, I read this email that I may have normally have skipped over. And this email was from Jake Barton, who is the principal at Local Projects. And Local Projects has been involved in, in the 9-11 memorial um, since almost the beginning of, of the project. And, and there was a point in, the, in this uh, process of the memorial where, where they 
He came to um, local projects with a very interesting problem. Michael Arad, who was the um, main architect for, for the memorial, had come up with this idea that rather than having the names in the memorial being um, ordered in some specific way, like alphabetically or chronologically, he wanted the names to embody these things that he called meaningful adjacencies. Now, this is kind of a case of a, of a, of a um, technical term uh, masking the real life thing. So a meaningful adjacency, these are the relationships that build our lives. So um, brothers and sisters and friends and coworkers. So the idea, the central idea for the memorial was that the names, rather than being arranged in, in, in a typical order, would be arranged to satisfy these meaningful adjacency requests, these requests that were made by the next of kin of the victims who died um, in 9-11. In, in so um, this is, this is a, a very interesting uh, idea, but it's an idea that leads to a very complicated problem. And, and the problem lies in the density of these relationships. So um, there, there were more than uh, 2,900 names, almost 3,000 victim names that had to end up on the memorial. And there were about 1,400 of these adjacency requests. So when I start to work on a project like this, the very first thing that I want to do is I want to visualize the data. People often get confused and think that visualization is an end product. But visualization is also a very valuable part of the process that leads us to the solving of a problem. So uh, I built this visualization. Well, wrong visualization. Um, so these, these adjacency uh, requests are, are from one name to another. And, and in some cases, these links may look something like this. But more often, because of the density of relationship, uh, I don't know what I was thinking when I built that transition. Um, because of the density of, of relationships, we, we often get these types of clusters of, of relations. So I, I built a, a very simple visualization in the beginning, which allowed me to get a look at the density of these connections. So on the left-hand side is the North Pool. On the right-hand side is the South Pool. And the lines between the names, which are arranged radially, uh, are those connections. So this is the very first graphic that I made when I was involved in the project, because I wanted to understand, first of all, what, what does 3,000 names look like? And then what kind of density do we have within those, those relationships? And so this, this complex area in the North Pool was the part that was the um, big challenge. Um, in mathematics, we would call this type of project an optimization problem. There, there may be many, many, many solutions for this project, uh, for this problem. We don't necessarily know what the right solution looks like, but we have a metric to judge each individual solution. We know that we would like to solve as many of these adjacency requests as possible. So the first thing that, we, that I did was I um, wrote an algorithm. So I wrote an algorithm which works in two parts. The first part takes those names um, and assembles them into what we call the adjacency clusters. So these adjacency clusters, which end up a little bit like puzzle pieces, allow us to link the names together to satisfy those requests that were done by the next of kin. So here you see um, the puzzle pieces that came out of just one of the nine groups that, that are um, in, in the memorial. And then after we have those puzzle pieces, the second um, part is to, to take them and try to put them into the available space. Now, these graphics are from the uh, exercising of the software program. So they're a little bit misleading because I've compacted the very long, narrow walls into these very short pieces so that I can see the process unfold. But we can, we can see the space get filled up by those puzzle pieces with very, very little remaining space in between. And that allowed us to, to get the first pass at these layouts for the memorial that um, would satisfy all of the adjacency requests. So that's the computer part of this problem. But there's also, of course, a very human part to this problem. Right? I don't know if there's any more human project that, that could be worked on than a memorial. And, and anybody who's ever worked with architects know that architects are very exacting people. So we can have the computer do a first pass at this problem, but the actual result was involved a lot of human effort as well. 
Um, and then also, of course, the memorial is a design problem. And I'll just skip through um, this reasonably, reasonably quickly here um, to give you an idea of the kind of depth of complexity we were dealing with when we had to write this software. So if you visit the memorial, you'll see that the metal plates which make up the, um, the sides of the pools, they have half-inch expansion joints so that when the metal gets warm in the summer and cold in the winter, the, the, um, the metal doesn't, uh, doesn't fall apart. Um, so what the architects didn't want is they didn't want this. They didn't want the names to line up against those expansion joints. Instead, what they wanted is they wanted this, so that names could cross those expansion uh, joints where possible. Now, that's nice um, for a name that ends with a D and, and starts with an S, but for an, a name that ends with a T and starts with a J, that crossing across that expansion joint is no longer possible. So that filling algorithm that I showed you a moment ago had to consider the typography of each name to understand where it could and where it couldn't lie within the memorial. Um, uh, names with, with uh, punctuation, they didn't want the punctuation to sit um, near that gap as well. So there were a lot of these layered levels of complexity that the algorithm ne needed to deal with. But once, once the computer had done its job, we also built a software program. And this software program, again built in processing, allowed the architects to go through and manually move the names where they needed to do so. So they might be uh, moving them by a few millimeters to uh, improve the placement. They might be switching two names to, to give a different story. They, they may be looking for three M's stacked on top of each other, which they didn't want to see. They, they wanted to look for four-letter words that may have um, uh, mistakenly being spelled um, down in the memorial. So there were a lot of human things that had to happen inside of this process. Um, and, and there are a lot of photographs now of this memorial. I completed, we completed our work on the memorial in the spring of 2010 and then for, uh, or of 2009, and then, and then for quite a long time, um, it sort of was under a veil of secrecy. This, this photograph is always really important to me because this is the first time I saw the, um, the, the um, actual engraved names in the memorial early in the spring when they started installing those plates. So, Anybody who lives in New York this time of year, uh, whenever we see a clear blue sky, we're reminded of 9-11. Of and those are the days when you start to hear people's stories about how, they, how their lives intersected with, with these events. And I think one of the most amazing things about the Finnish memorial and about Michael Arad's vision for this memorial was this idea that the memorial would embody people's lives. So the data in this case, these names, rather than just being placed um, separately, they were placed in context. And it's this context of the data which gives them the, the meaning, their role inside of these narratives, which are embodied inside of, of this um, memorial. So these are embodied histories inside of the memorial. Um, now, now to, to, to jump. Um, gears a little bit. I lied to you when I said we weren't going to talk about anything we did at the New York Times R&D Lab because I'm briefly going to talk about this project called Open Paths because I think it resonates a little bit with what I would like to talk to you about today. Uh, Open Paths is a, is a tool which allows you to take the location data that's stored on your iPhone or your iDevice and upload it um, and, and visualize it and possibly share this data with researchers. So when we began this project, we had this idea that people would be able to take their data that, that's on the phones, which together collectively is the largest database of location data in the world, and we could piece that together and then share that data, broker relationships between the people um, who, were, who would put the data together and these researchers who, who, who could use that data. So these pieces of location data, these are fragments of our own lives in this case. These are pieces of our own history and, and that we could assemble these together. But at the time when we were building this project, we, we were thinking of the, these numbers just as that, as numbers. So something like this. This is a location stamp. So it may not mean anything to you, but this is the moment that I touched down into New York. Um, this is my interview at the New York Times. This is the moment where I met my girlfriend. Right? So these pieces of information, they gain context when they're put into, into our own lives. I have this real allergy to the term data exhaust. Right? These, these numbers, these are data exhaust. 
But data exhaust, these are pieces of our lives. They're tethered to parts of our, own, of our own individuality. And in the same way that we could consider photographs to be data exhaust, by putting these pieces of data into context, we can give them tremendous amounts of more meaning. When a photograph goes into a photo album, it, it gets context. It becomes part of our, of our lives and our stories, and those photographs gain meaning. Um, so th this idea of putting data in, into context is the, one of the most important things that I would like to, to, to um, talk to you in this, in this very short time that I have with you. There are a couple of other things, though, as well. This idea of building tools that allow us to explore and work with our data. I use this open source tool called Processing, which is, which is um, something that, that I hope a, a lot of you will, will take a look at. We're releasing a new version of Processing, Processing 2.0, which should be released within a month, which will allow data to be published or um, projects to be published simultaneously to the web. Um, to, as a Java applet and to Android devices as well with no change to the code base, which is very exciting. Um, and that's really what allowed us to, to, to be successful with, with these types of projects. So I don't have any more time. I, have 14, I had 14 minutes and the, and, and the um, graphic is blinking at me to, to go away. But I would love to continue the discussion about these things at, with the, all of you at this conference and beyond. So please um, get in touch with me. And I would love to hear for, um, from you. And thank you, and enjoy the rest of your conference.